Welcome to our event this evening, which is our Adventurer's Case um, Pick of the Range. We will be looking at the wines in the case that is part of the uh, Pick of the Range offer with our three buyers this evening. We've got Matthew Horsley, Freddie Bulmer and Sarah Knowles, MW. Just before we kick off, because we do have six wines to cover this evening, I'll just do a brief uh, little bit of housekeeping. Firstly, my name's Catherine from the tastings team here at the Wine Society. And I'm joined by my colleague Anna behind the scenes, who is making sure all the tech works lovely and smoothly, smoothly and we'll be sharing our slides and images as we go. Now, hopefully you'll have been to many of our Zoom events, but if this is your first one, welcome. Um, we've got a couple of ways that we would just like you to be able to use the Zoom webinar this evening if you want to interact with us. So if you want to pass any sort of comments on the wines and um, to let us know what you're thinking of them as you're drinking, please do use the chat function. If you've got specific questions about the wines or questions that you'd like to put to the buyers, please use the Q&A. Myself and Anna will be monitoring that as we go so we can ask your questions for you. If you have any technical issues, you can drop Anna a message using uh, the chat function by directing it to tastings team. And you can also drop us an email directly at tastings at thewinesociety.com. So, as I say, we've got uh, six wines from the three buyers this evening from across of their, their regions they buy for. We'll be starting off with Sarah. And I think we'll just pop in the chat as well what the tasting order is for this evening. I did pop it in the email earlier on, but we'll pop it on there for you tonight as well. So, Sarah, welcome. Over to you. Good evening, it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm just opening my bottle, so um, I hope you are too, and those of you that have joined us. And I'm showing a fairly um, rare white grape variety from Northern Italy. So this is from Piedmont. Um, it's called Gnaschetta, um, and I'm sure I could be corrected on the pronunciation. Um, although, <laughs> although I would um, always suggest that with Italian wines, you should just go for it and not worry about the pronunciation of the grapes too much and just enjoy drinking them. Um, but it's been DOC um, approved, um, and it's quite a recent DOC approving. So this is from an area within Piedmont called the Lange. We have a Lange Nebbiolo that was recently made into an exhibition label, which is um, part of the trend of the sort of increased presence of perhaps the Lange as a, as a sub-region. Um, and the, this wine is, is Lange DOC wine. Um, it's very rare. So even within this co-op, so this is made by Cantina di Nebbiolo, who are a, a co-op that we work with, and they have over 180 different members, um, but they only have four members who have any of this grape variety. Um, and they were initially only working with about three or four hectares of it. And it's actually all within um, the Lange portion of their vines. The majority of their members have grapes in the Roero, which is the other district um, within Piemont. So it's quite interesting that they've decided to sort of feature this almost sort of rare to, to extinction grape variety. And they're trying to sort of see whether it could be a flagship for their region. And so they've put quite a lot of effort into it and they bottle it under their um, higher grade um, premium quality level and they make it in quite a premium way. So it's, it's picked uh, by hand and then it's um, crushed um, after it's been slightly cooled. It's steel fermented and then it sits um, and ages or at least 20% of it ages in acacia barrel, um, which is quite typical of Italian winemaking to use non um, oak variety wood. Um, but here it definitely adds to the texture um, of this grape. And hopefully those of you that are tasting it will see that it's, it might seem a little bit scary to taste something that's um, extremely rare from, from Northern Italy without very much of a clue. But actually it's very approachable. It, it's a very floral sort of grape variety. It's got lots of sage flavors, herbal flavors, um, lemon flavors. And uh, I think it works very well. And we've actually been buying this wine from the moment they started making it. So we've really um, enjoyed working with this grape variety and we encourage them to make more of it and to keep playing. Um, so no, I'm wondering really what um, Freddie and Matthew, what are you thinking of this wine? Hello. <laughs> I, I really, I'm enjoying it. I've never had it before. It's a completely new grape to me and 
I'm almost slightly embarrassed to say I hadn't actually noticed it uh, in the range until it came in this mixed case. So it's genuinely a, a new discovery for me. But yeah, it's lovely. I think um, uh, it's got a, a beautiful kind of, as you, well, as you alluded to, a textural element, but it's still fresh and lifted and, and bright. But one thing I was wondering, Sarah, is you, you touch on the acacia barrels. What might a drinker expect to, to find in a, in a wine that's been aged in acacia as opposed to oak? And do you yeah. see that in this wine? Definitely. So I think what's, so it's a cup that's a pairing of things. So I think with French oak that we're used to, um, what we often taste is some of that vanilla character that comes through or that very fine cedary character. And some of that comes from the oak, but it also comes from the treatment of the oak. So it has been um, usually charred on the inside. Acacia barrels, this is a 10 hectolitre um, acacia barrel that this has been um, aged in. And it doesn't have a very high toasting so it's not going for that kind of very sweet vanilla flavors. And I think acacia tends to have quite a tight grain. So it also has slightly less oxidation um, and it's quite, a, you know, it's a hardwood. And so it's, it's going to have less um, flavor impact and more about the textural. So, so it's, that's where it sort of sits. it's a fairly inert type of wood to use then really. Reasonably. Yeah. It's not, it's definitely not going for a, a sort of lick of chocolate or vanilla. Sure. Um, that obviously works here. The, uh, the wood's really, nicely managed and, and maybe it just kind of, yeah, plays a part in the textural element of the wine without being at all obvious. Matthew, I'm sorry, I, I, you're probably dying to, 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 to chip in on this. I'm, I'm gonna go back and have another drop of it, I think. I was gonna ask basically exactly the same thing about how the oak impacts it, because it's definitely a great example of uh, a wine being matured in wood more for the textural uh, impact rather than flavor impact, but it, it is very, quite viscous and very textural which is which is amazing and there's a definite lovely kind of florality on the nose but the palate is quite savory there's quite fennelly which is which is lovely because mm -hmm. i think that a lot of italian whites can be relatively neutral but this has got yeah. genuine character uh, and i think it's fantastic for me there's also with this one quite a spice on the finish so I, and i often wonder if that's partly due to the grape and partly due to the oak but um but there seems to be quite a a savory kind of um yeah yeah spice note um to the to the end um no i'm very glad to continue buying our small allocation of it each year so they're, they're not making a lot of this they only make about fifteen thousand bottles of it a year um at this quite large cooperative with as i say 180 members um so this is this is you know something that's really quite rare even even you know for us to, to not be able to get as much as we could sell of it. So it's only ever on sale for a, a small time each year. We tend to tend to have it for a couple of months. Um, Sarah. I'm glad it's looking good. Yeah. Um, it, it strikes me that it might actually be quite a nice sort of versatile food wine. So it has got a little bit of body to it and, and freshness. I know it's obviously um, yeah. quite an unusual or rare grape variety, but do you have any idea of what the locals might, might eat with something like this? Well, I guess, Piedmont, um, it's hard not to not think about truffles. Truffles, yeah. <laughs> truffles, the first thing that came to mind for me. Truffles and pasta <laughs> and butter. And, you know, it's a very, um, it's a very easy, it's easy to taste this wine and to think that it would work quite well because it's got the acidity that would cut through some of the fashionness and it's got that lovely kind of herbaceousness. And, ah, somebody's got a pasta with walnut sauce Ooh, and it seems nice. to go well. Very nice. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a great matching for this because, uh, you know, Lovely, especially Northern Italian white wines really do have the acidity to cut through creamy sauces or buttery sauces or olive oil, rich dishes, um, but don't need too much flavor to be overpowered. So lovely seafood dishes or um, gentle things like, uh, you know, pork loin with, um, you know, simple flavorings and simple, simple, um, you know, nothing too over the top that's going to dominate this wine, but something that, um, that needs a little bit of acidity to cut through. We've had a question, Sarah, and this might be something that um, Matthew and Freddie, you can also chip in on. And it's something that comes up um, quite often, actually. And it's something that would be, I don't know how easy it will be for you to kind of um, qualify or put a descriptor to. But we've had a question from Roger regarding uh, textural um, as a descriptor, as the textural influence. What specifically would you mean or would you expect to perhaps kind of feel if you've got a wine that is... Yeah. quite textural like this is so for me it's a and i'm sure it'll be different for each of us which is the complexity of, of wine and why it's so difficult to describe um what we're tasting so so please bear with us because i promise that the the differences that we might have um 
are something to be celebrated um, in our tasting and experience of wine. But um, I know it can be com confusing when we're talking about it and trying to describe it for members. For me, it's very much a combination of a kind of acidity, acidity um, note, but also something that um, with red wines, we'd always talk about tannins. And with white wines, there are white wines with tannin. So here for me, um, I tend to taste acidity on the front of my tongue and on the sides after I've swallowed. Um, so you kind of get a quick hit like um, sherbet, and then you get the, the acid sort of on the, running down the side of your mouth after you've drunk quite a high acid wine. Here, for me, the acid is going across after I've um, swallowed it, which for me gives a bit of a broader, more broader profile, despite it being still quite um, fresh and balanced. It's not a, it's not a, a, a oily wine. Um, we often talk about textural elements around sort of um, imagining if you're flipping your tongue through milk or if you're flipping your tongue through um, water. And we would say that milk has a heavier weight to it. Um, I don't think that this, interestingly, sort of goes between. So it's not a heavy weight wine. It doesn't have the weight of milk. It's got more of the weight of water, but it's got that broader acidity that sits across the palate. And I think that then hits the cheeks and kind of goes up, um, which then for me is that texture. And that's where the tannins would be for me. So it's that drying, cheek puckering, kind of flat acidity, um, which I think I describe as texture. Um, it's sometimes like licking a stone, um, which I think is, again, another silly thing to say, but as something that we perhaps all did, we all licked chalk fingers after um, um, working with chalk as children or whatever we may have done, and, and that kind of texture of dust and, and tannin. Um, but no, Matthew, Freddie, have I done it any sort of... Justice to how you would describe textural white wine. I, th I think you've gone above and beyond there, to be perfectly honest. That was, yeah, that was <laughs> yeah. really amazing. I was just going to say the wine tastes a bit thicker than normal. So. <laughs> you know, but I think there is there is a different, you know, because I often think that fuller bodied wines can often have higher residual sugar. And so they're, they're rounder, yep. more oily. Yeah. Um, this it's isn't very... that. It's more drying. One thing that we're all guilty of, uh, those of us who, who write tasting notes um, for a living, is not always saying what texture it is. Because texture, well, there's, there's God knows how many different types of texture out there. Um, but really, for me, when I'm talking about texture, it's just uh, something that I might write about in a note when I'm very conscious while tasting a wine of how it feels. Some wines are just light and crisp and go down very very easily and you wouldn't necessarily think about the texture of that wine but often yeah it is a fuller wine as you sort of as you quite rightly say Sarah that makes you think about it and and literally just how it feels on your tongue and how it feels in, in your mouth um, and then you can sort of drill down into it a little bit more as we probably should do in tasting notes rather than just saying this is a textural wine we should say it has x type of texture um it's, it's one of those things with with red wines when we talk about tannins they can be quite easy to describe you know dusty or or grippy whereas with white wines the texture can be a little bit harder to to to, to, to put across so yeah we should we should do better at that More often i find the description isn't very appetizing yeah. <laughs> and i, I want well. people to, to feel appetized by these wines or, or to want to enjoy them and i very much enjoy them otherwise i would not ship them and sell them but um but sometimes when you're suggesting that it's like licking a, a dusty chalkboard, it's <laughs> yeah. it doesn't quite convey what what you what you're hoping for. But um, but no texture, um, a complicated subject. We've had one other question, and I don't know how complicated this may be, um, but it's back to the um, acacia, mm -hmm. and it is a weather. Now let me just find it. Whether it's is it cheaper than oak as a wood to use? Um, John Lamond is, is suggesting it might be or it's more easily available, which I don't know if that's um, yeah. So it definitely was more easily available for Italian wine producers historically, um, because they you know there aren't many oak forests in Italy, and um, trade between Italy and France has always been sort of on and off. Um, as with Spain and France, so Spain then famously turned to American oak for styles like Rioja, um, and so much of the kind of ingredient or the ingredients, the um, the equipment that you might need for winemaking actually connects to something much more fundamentally simple, like uh, how your trade routes are going at the time. And acacia was something that Italians could get hold of more easily, um, along with lots of oak coming actually from Slovenia, um, so Slovenian or Slavonian oak, as it's always referred to. 
is um, is very prevalent in Italy and is slightly less expensive than French, but good oak and good acacia. Um, so the, the oak that barrels that these guys will be using will be almost equivalently priced. So there wouldn't be a, a saving really here anymore. Okay. So I think we are ready for our next wine. So Matthew, it's over to you. Great. Hello. Uh, so this is the Society's Greek White uh, 2021 vintage. It's it literally just been released. So many of you will probably be trying this vintage for the first time. Uh, this is a wine that came into our range um, probably three years ago. I think Freddie, Freddie brought it into the range in 2019. So this was the second time that I had a chance to, to blend it. But this time was different and I actually got, a, got to go out to Greece to do it in person rather than remotely in, a, in my bedroom. So it was really nice to, to go out there and, um, and blend it. It's a, it's a blend of two um, indigenous Greek varieties. There I am. Um, with a beautiful view outside of Semeli, which uh, I'll, go out, I'll go into in a second. Uh, but the blend is two indigenous Greek, Greek grape varieties. We've got uh, Mushka Filaro, which uh, constitutes 55% of this blend. And then Roditis, which is 45%. Uh, Roditis is the, the most common grape variety found in, in Retsina. And, uh, and Moshko Filaro. Moshko uh, descends from the term aromatic, and so it gives an idea as to the style of the wine. It is a very aromatic wine and gives kind of rose hippie aromas and I think almost kind of like a, like a sherbet-y note on the nose. And then Roditis typically gives quite apple-y um, apple fruit. And a, and a bit of body and weight because because Moshka Filaro is naturally very acidic and so sometimes it, it helps having something just to round out that palate. We talked about texture just now. This is this is a slightly differently textured wine. It's a little bit fresher and leaner and a bit bit brighter on the palate. If that makes sense, that probably sounds even more complicated now. Um, so yes, the Moshka Filaro comes uh, well. Basically, the wine's made uh, in the Peloponnese, which is that little offshoot at the bottom of the Greek mainland. The Moshka Filaro comes from the PDO of Mantinia, which is pretty much slap bang in the middle of the Peloponnese. And the Roditis comes from the PDO of Patras, which is on the northwesterly coast. And up until this year, well, up until the last year, 2021, the wine was made at Semeli, which was the picture that you just, just saw there of me, which um, is, is an absolutely gorgeous winery uh, in the village of Kutsi, which is where some of the finest Ayogitiko vines are. Um, the, uh, so it was made by a chap called Leonidas Nasiakos, who I think we've got a picture of as well, um, but he's no longer the winemaker at Semeli. And so instead, um, the interesting thing is that um, although he was making the wine at Semeli, it was actually from vines that his family own. And so when he was no longer the winemaker at Semeli, basically had a choice. Do I get Semeli to continue making the wine with their grapes? Or do I follow the winemaker who's got the grapes um, and the vines um, that have gone into the previous vintages? So, you know, the choice was obvious. You, you go with the winemaker and you, you keep the grapes. And so now um, the wine is made, well, for this vintage anyway, is made at the um, Quintonis winery. And on there, on the left there in the blue shirt is George Quintonis, who's the, um, the ma main winemaker there. And so this is me with Leonidas in the middle and George um, just after doing our blending session back in November. Um, and so Leonidas is now basically building his own winery so that from the next vintage from 2022 um, will be, it'll be being made at his own winery. So it was really good of George to, to step in and, and help Leonidas. They're very good friends. Um, so he basically opened up his winery to, to Leonidas to have the wine made there, which is fantastic. Um, 2021 is a slightly warmer vintage than 2020. And so the wine is a little bit fuller. Uh, it's half a degree more in alcohol. Um, and so I do find there's a little bit more weight on the palate compared to previous years. Uh, but it is a very arom aromatic, unoaked style of, of white wine. And I think it's really, really very charming. Um, I'm getting married in a few months and this will be the white wine that I serve. So <laughs> I hope you all enjoy it if you've got it. It's looking lovely, Matthew. It's, um, yeah, so you're saying this, is, this vintage has literally just hit the shelves, basically. It's, it's tasting so fresh and it's got a nice um, combination for me of uh, a sort of ever so slightly rounded, yeah, slightly fuller body, but then lovely lifted fresh aromatics. It's um, really the best of both worlds with the two grape varieties. Looking yeah, definitely. I think they complement each other really nicely and the, the blend has been very similar over the three years. I think the first thing was straight 50-50. 
And then last year, I think I went kind of 57% Moshka Filaro because the, ironically, last year, the Roditis was so good that you needed more Moshka Filaro to yeah. get that aromatics. Whereas this year, the Moshka Filaro was, was lovely. And so um, they balanced out each other really nicely. Yeah, no, it's looking really nice. It's, again, it's a, a real kind of best of both worlds style, I think, because it's not too OTT aromatic. You know, it's not quite, you know, for example, something like Gewürztraminer is not everybody's cup of tea because it's so uh, incredibly pungent. Um, but you've you've still got the lovely aromas there, but it, it's kind of, yeah, tied in quite nicely. And um, for the finished products looking looking great. Good. Really nice. Sarah, enjoy it. Delicious. Sarah's and, saying um, why she hates it. No, no, I think the, the key is also that it's um, it's 12.5%. So it's so wonderfully light and fresh. Mm-hmm. And that aromatic is so... Um, um, impa- like powerful. It's a very perfumed, um, clearly kind of um, summery. Like it invokes all those summer memories, and it has a very similar sensation for me as Sauvignon, yeah. um, although a very different taste profile. In that it's just instantly joyful because it smells so good. And Sauvignon has that wonderful thing of just you smell it across a room and you want to have a glass of it and relax and and sit down. And I think the same is very much true of this. Mm in that very powerful, very fresh, very clean, very floral aromatics um, that really lift it. And then, of course, on the palate, I think I love that kind of pink grapefruit skin um, mm. note that, again, I think is a little bit textural, although less, less so than the first wine, perhaps. It's, it's more of that lovely, fresh acidity and, and slightly more linear in the palate, um, which is, is just charming and makes it very drinkable. Um, which is a silly thing to say about wine that we all buy hoping that it is of course drinkable but um, but hopefully um you know what we you know what we might mean yes as something i always find myself writing in notes saying this is uh, very drinkable and then I think gosh out of context that's hardly a compliment is it yeah. <laughs> uh, i think we just had somebody and stepping on catherine's toes perhaps but about food pairings and asking whether this could go with spicier food uh, was i stepping on your toes catherine i just only it, only yeah. slightly only that i was <laughs> gonna you know say that obviously this is a wine that you think summer holidays you know greek food mezza platters but with the texture element and the aromatics it does have so many opportunities so matthew what do you yeah think? yeah I, I think they would it would definitely work with, with with spicy food that kind of aromatic character uh lends itself really well to you know kind of fusion cooking um and probably not too spicy uh, and probably more towards the kind of thai um kind of fresh chilies and noodles and that sort of thing rather than kind of your indian curries um so anything that's really refreshing um on the palate would 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 work i think really well with this because it it is a dry wine but there's there's a little bit of residual sugar it's like two grams at most and just just weighs out the palate quite nicely and i think that would work would work really well with with some of the with with spicier food it's really fresh kind of chili based uh, asian dishes Lovely. So let's go on to the first of our red lineup. Thank you, Matthew. Let's go on to Freddie with his first wine. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we're going to go to Moldova. You might notice, first of all, if you've got the bottle at home, that the label actually isn't the same anymore as uh, what we have on the website. So they snuck in a, a label change, but it's very much the same wine that's in the bottle. I'm going to pour myself a little bit here. So the first thing really to note on this wine, uh, and actually... The, the real thing that drew me to, to the wine in the first place and made me buy it is, you know, decent Pinot Noir that tastes like Pinot Noir at £6.50. Uh, you don't see many of those around, frankly. Um, famously, it's a great variety, which is very hard to make and uh, and therefore often has a price tag to, to match the effort that people have to go to. Um, but Moldova is one of those countries which is a real home of excellent value uh, in the wine world. Um, just first of all, to cover off a few interesting things about Moldova as a, as a wine producing country, it's something that we, you know, we don't see loads of Moldovan wines in the UK, uh, but they have an incredible uh, history and, and wine industry, actually. I mean, Moldova is home to the biggest wine cellars in the world. There's a winery that's got 200 kilometers of cellars uh, in Moldova and you can drive a car around them, um, which is quite ridiculous. Um, there's a map here. So, um, we're with, with um, Vartali, Chateau Vartali, we're in the, uh, the, the big green central Kodru uh, region here, um, which is the main wine producing region, certainly in terms of, of volume. 
Um, wine production in Moldova accounts for 30% uh, of Moldova's total, Moldova's total uh, export earnings, uh, but 90% of it is exported to uh, Russia and the Ukraine, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly given where Moldova sits on the map. Um, and the wine industry in Moldova contributes to 25% uh, of the country's GDP, which is quite quite remarkable um, considering that I think for most people in the UK Moldovan wine is um, fairly something that, that most people are pretty unfamiliar with really uh, perhaps you know going back a few years we might have seen a little bit more of it and, and certainly you know we'll come on to it same sort of story with, with Bulgaria it was perhaps a little bit more common a few years ago um, but basically the point is here that wine production is a massive massive industry for Moldova and uh, in some good years I, I, I believe they make uh, they, they rank as the sort of the seventh highest production wine country in the world. Um, so they're pumping out a lot of the stuff. Now it's not always the most um, uh, what's the word? Not always the most. I don't want to say consistent is the word I'm looking for uh, in terms of quality of wines. And I think even with some of the best producers and Chateau Vartely being uh, one of, if not the great producer. Um, for consistency uh, in, in Moldova, but you do have to make sure that you're pretty hot on tasting each vintage as it comes in. You know, as a buyer, there's some countries and wineries where you know that, do you know what, every single year it's gonna be damn good. We'll still taste a sample anyway, to be sure, but uh, it would be a real surprise if it wasn't just as good as it was last year. But with somewhere like this, um, and, and you know, the Pinot Noir is a prime example, um, it's about picking the right vintages. So I've tasted this a few times this was uh, a vintage I was really, really happy with. And I thought, actually, you know, as £6.50 Pinot Noir goes, um, it's pretty great. But then, unfortunately, the next vintage, I was sent a sample of the 18 and the 19, and I wasn't quite as pleased with them. So I made the decision, despite it being a very inexpensive Pinot, to, to not continue buying. But, of course, we'll revisit every time. So make the most of, of, of this wine is what I'm trying to say. Um, the thing that I like about it is... OK, you know, you're not going to expect, you know, Gevry Chambertin or something like that. It's £6.50, but on the nose, it smells like Pinot. Um, and also there's a little bit of a, a kind of a savoury character on the nose as well, which I think is quite nice to see, certainly in a wine at this end of the, of the sort of the price spectrum. Um, some of the better inexpensive Pinots that I have tasted from around the world generally are very um, uh, sort of, you know, very fruit forward, very bright, very fragrant um, and very pretty but don't really have much in the way of that sort of typical uh, sort of farmyardy kind of <laughs> kind of thing that people sometimes associate with, with good Pinot. Whereas I think this has got kind of the best of both worlds. Um, and then on the palate, uh, I'm going to actually have a little sip. Hmm. On the palate, I think it's a really drinkable style. Um, it's got some character. Uh, again, you know, keeping that price point in mind, I think this offers fantastic value. So I was really pleased with this when I when I found it. Um, and I, I think it's a really good example of what what Bulgaria, what Moldova um, can do when 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 they get it right. You know, Chateau Bartoli, uh, a winery that we've worked with for a long, long time. And we've dipped in and out of different uh, wines and different grape varieties from them. Um, but we've worked with them for a long time. I mean, S Sebastian uh, started working with them years ago, but it's because they've always made good wines. And yes, you have to pick and choose and, uh, and, and you know, as a buyer, select what's particularly good from, from one year and, and on to the next. But, um, but I think that they're a really brilliant winery. And, and I think um, Moldova, thanks largely to producers like Chateau Bartoli, is definitely, definitely a wine country, which is worth, worth exploring, worth trying these wines. They've got lots of indigenous grapes. And, and actually one thing to just touch on before I, um, before I uh, move on to, the, on to the next wine in a second, um, is that normally with these countries that have so many fantastic uh, and often unusual indigenous grapes, that's what I'm interested in, in listing for the Wine Society. You know, you can get at the end of the day, Pinot Noir from God knows how many other countries, you can get Chardonnay from however many other countries and so on, but you can't always get Fetiasca Niagara or something like that um, from other parts of the world. So normally that's what I would, would focus on when working with places like, like Moldova. However, every now and again, something comes along from an international grape variety, which I think is a great solid example of that actually at a, a potentially unbeatable price from anywhere else. Um, and um, that was the case here. So I hope people uh, enjoy it. 
Um, Matthew and Sarah, I don't know if you've got any thoughts. If they're positive ones, do speak up. If not, you know, stay on mute. <laughs> yeah, it's you're absolutely right. It's it's cracking value and it smells and tastes of Pinot, which is the most important thing. But there's a lovely, almost kind of Syrah-ish pepperiness on the palate as well, which I think is a really nice touch. Um, to see see any oak or fermented in stainless steel and then left in. I think it does see a little bit a little bit of oak, which is something that's quite remarkable again for a wine that's so cheap. But I think is testament for um, testament to the value that Moldova can can uh, offer um but yeah and i think also the fact that it's it's 2017 it's a it's a you know had a few years in bottle um has helped to kind of soften it out in, in the same way as well um to me the perfume is is really impressive this is a complex wine um and often it you know we can't say the price point too frequently but um <laughs> often often at this sort of price you don't get an incredibly complex perfume no, um, actually, I think this is this is offering a huge amount with that almost licorice-ness coming through and spice and some savoury uh, sort of classic red fruits you'd expect from Pinot. Um, yeah. So no, I'm, it's, a, it's a bit of a winner. <laughs> Good. I'm very glad. Very we glad. had a question, Freddie, from Andrew. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And I, going back to what you said at the beginning, this may be perhaps um, some members' first introduction to Moldovan wine, or it might be something they've not visited in, in quite a while um and he's asking are there any other moldovan wines you'd like to list and i would add on to that are there any that we already do list that you think members should be checking out yeah so basically um moldova is one of those countries where we haven't ever uh introduced a, a vast number of of wineries to the range um so chateau vartali has been for a long time the only uh moldovan winery that we've that we've worked with um However, they do do a whole host of, of different wine uh, styles, uh, different wines. They've got a load of different labels as well. Different, I mean, sometimes in this part of the world, um, one winery will produce a just a mind boggling number of different ranges and so on. Um, so they do make an awful lot of wines. For me, I think um, uh, there's a couple of wines of theirs that I'm particularly excited about. One I did mention um, earlier, Feteasca Niagara, uh, and I think we, we might have some on the way. Um, uh, but anyway, it's very, very good uh, indigenous grape varieties, sort of a bit more full-bodied uh, than the Pinot. Um, but one in particular that I'm really excited about, and I discovered at a Moldovan tasting a few years ago, is a grape variety called Viorica, uh, V-I-O-R-I-C-A. Um, and actually, stylistically, it's not too dissimilar to, to Matthew's Greek white in that it's a, it's a dry, crisp, dry wine, but with a lovely sort of floral aroma. Um, and it, yeah, it was one that I tasted at a Moldovan tasting uh, and, and immediately just thought, oh, this is it's really nice, quite sort of muscatty in a way, but I think it's got a little bit more, a little bit more concentration on the palate than muscat sometimes has, um, certainly at that sort of price point, because again, it's the same sort of price as this. Um, and that was one that uh, came out as a winner in last year's Wine Champions um, as well, which I think was sort of testament to it because it's a, it's a great variety that normally they would blend away uh, into, into something else. Um, but uh, I convinced them to bottle it as a single varietal. So, uh, so yeah, so those would be my, my two picks. Have we lost Catherine just quickly there? That's fine. I'm, oh, I'm, it, sounds, <laughs> it sounds like we might have lost Catherine. So you'll get a Hello. moment of me. <laughs> we got the substitute from, on. Oh, no. The substitute. <laughs> With bad well, lighting. So I apologise, members. Um, um, but I think we're probably ready to move on to the yeah. next one, if that's all right. It's one of yours as well, isn't it? Yes. The next one so is I'll me. jump off and let you carry on. Perfect stuff. Okie doke. So... Next wine is uh, still me, so apologies, everybody. Um, so we're in Austria this time. So family mantler, um, Zweigelt. Uh, so yes, 2019. This is one where the label on the bottle does match the, uh, the photograph. So this is a wine that we've worked with for, oh, a few years, maybe since about 2018, I want to say, or thereabouts, 2018, 2019. Um, this was actually... Uh, first sold under the bin series label which um some of you watching might be familiar with this was uh, uh bin two i believe it was certainly one of the early ones um 
Now, uh, there's an Austrian map, if Anna, if you could, that's the one. So it's a little bit hard to see, but as you can see, all the wine production really is over in the eastern part of Austria. And now up towards the top, Anna, if you can use your cursor and point at Camptal DAC, which is just left a little bit, up a little bit, that's the one. Um, so that's uh, the, the bottom right hand corner of that sort of Camptal DAC section is sticking in the, the Camptal region. That's it, a red dot, lovely. Um, now, just over the border from there into the Weinviertel DAC is uh, its family Mantler. So up, that's sort of up there. But yeah, that'll do. That'll do in that general area. Um, family Mantler are a lovely, lovely, genuinely teeny tiny family winery uh, that I kind of happened upon by chance, really. Um, I was sent a bottle of their Zweigelt and their Gruner a few years ago. And you know, call me a skeptic. I didn't have particularly high expectations and I tasted them. I went, oh gosh, these are really bloody good, you know, and it was a winery that nobody's heard of. Even a lot of the other Austrian winemakers that I speak to don't know uh, Family Mantler. Um, and now a third generation winery, I believe. Um, but they have for a long, long time uh, been one of those quite sort of classically Austrian or even just European families that have always had some vines, you know, along with some chickens and some other bits and bobs, but they've really focused on the wine production uh, within the last kind of three generations. Um, so if we just quickly flip back to that family photo um, of all of them, if we can, uh, uh, it's gonna pop up any second now, the one previous, um, because basically on the left hand side there, thank you. So we've got Sarah and Thomas who are now kind of at the helm and they've now had three young kids. Um, so the next generation is, is up and coming. Then we've got Thomas's brother in the middle and, the, and their, their parents. So Sarah and Thomas very much, um, yeah, in the driving seat now and they're really taking things forward, but still really maintaining the same kind of ethos that they've had as a family for a long, long time. So what, they don't want to get big. They're not interested in getting big. They're interested in maintaining their relationships with their, uh, with their customers to the point that they actually have a family mantler truck that they will fill up once a week with all their wines and drive over all the way to the other side of Austria to the hotels in the ski resorts uh, and, and deliver themselves to all of their customers and, and keep in touch with them, which I think is a really nice touch. So Zweigeld uh, is a, a crossing of Blau Frankish and Saint Laurent, which was uh, created in 1922 by Dr. Zweigeld in Austria. Um, and I think it can be a really, really lovely grape variety when it's done right. So it is obviously an um, indigenous Austrian grape variety. Um, sometimes people do put a little bit too much oak on it, which I think is disappointing. I think in that part of, uh, of, of the world, there's among many slightly old fashioned producers, there's still this idea that more oak equals better wine. But of course, we know that that's not true. But in examples like this, where the fruit's really allowed to kind of sing, uh, I think it can be a really lovely, friendly, excellent value style of red wine. I describe it as a really sort of happy wine. You know, it's got a lovely, crunchy, fresh acidity to it bright, vibrant kind of Morello cherry fruit. Um, and it's a perfect wine that you can kind of, you know, drink any any night of the week, but really good with just, you know, casual pizza or pasta or something like that. Um, so I think it, I think Zweigel is a, is a great variety, which, um, which deserves a little bit more attention, certainly good examples like this, because it can offer genuinely fantastic value, uh, you know, versus anything from anywhere, uh, I believe anyway. Uh, so I hope you find that too. Um, Matthew and Sarah, I don't know if you've got any thoughts. Have you tried this before? You probably have when it was bin series, but that was a while ago. So it's a revisit perhaps. No, I think it was probably with the bin series that I last tried it, but it's, um, well, probably champs. Mm. But, um, mm. but no, it's great. I think Zweigel so offers a, a lovely kind of medium bodied um, spicy wine that can be very easily enjoyed with lots of different things. It's sort of, um, it's not a, it's not a wine that you have to worry too much about. Like you can just get yes. on and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I totally agree, Sarah. That's actually, that's a really good point. I think that's one of the, the, the wonderful things about Zweigel is actually the best examples I find are the ones that are just really easy to enjoy. You know, it doesn't need to be an overcomplicated, grown up wine necessarily. It just be really friendly. Yeah, I don't know whether it's, it's typical of the examples you're seeing more frequently. This very much has... Um, it's not all fruit, so there mm. is quite a savoury kind of green, um, sappy note on the nose, which I, I particularly like. So almost like um, rose stems or something. Um, yeah, that's a really good 
that kind of really gives it a bit more um bit more interest yeah uh, that's that's a good point simple. i like the rose stems that's quite a nice sounding thing but i know exactly what you mean now that you now that you say that and i think that slightly herbal kind of note is quite typical of of a lot of austrian red wines there's sort of quite a herbaceous and also fruity style. i mean you know that better than most Sarah, having bought austria before i did um but uh, it's also nice i think to see some of these red wines coming from the albeit you know all the wine regions of austria over in the east being from one of the more westerly eastern wine regions um and by that i mean as opposed to sort of bergenland which is the the home famously of austrian red wines um you get slightly more sappy vibrant styles from from this part of the country you know matthew if you had anything you wanted to, to add on this one yeah, I, I totally agree. It, it does have that lovely, sappy, spicy character, a bit kind of like a like a slightly fuller bodied menthia sort of peppery note as well. And yeah, it's and I think that the you mentioned the food is such an easy just crack open and we'll go with pretty much anything sort yeah. of one. And definitely even um the the tricky stuff like like pizza with with the tomato bases can be a little bit difficult sometimes but this is definitely that sort of pizza wine isn't it it's got lovely spice which would go well with pepperoni or whatever and and that juicy fruity core goes beautifully with with the with tomato based stuff so you know pasta yeah pizzas, yeah it's it's delicious and what what's really nice is that you know you said it's the it's a cross between san laurent and 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 Blau Frankish, and it's got the spicy notes of, of Blau Frankish, but it's got that lovely upfront fruity quality of, of Saint Laurent. So it's delicious. Yeah. Like it. Good. No, I'd say you're making me really hungry now. I just remembered I've got some uh, uh, proper Tuscan tomato and bread soup in the fridge for dinner, which is going to be perfect with this. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I've got lasagna and it'll work perfectly with oh, that. Spot so, on. Spot on. There we are. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you. No idea what I'm having for tea yet. <laughs> like fish fingers in the freezer. You probably have to order <laughs> a pizza. <laughs> no. um, you're much more organised than I am, both of you. Um, but I'm very jealous. <laughs> Good stuff. Yes, we might then be moving on. So yes, I I have the, I think the wildest of wild cards here because we're we're mainly tasting um, adventuring through Europe wines, um, and so this is our outlier, and it's our only wine. Um, from outside of Europe. And I think, um, I hope you'll all forgive me for putting it in, although, gosh, it looks as though with four reviews, that's not done very well. Um, <laughs> it, it is, in fact, selling extremely well, which I'm very glad about. Um, so potentially um, starting to, to see some of it come through. But um, but this is this is an odd listing for me. I, I tasted it in a, in a much wider context, um, along with a number of other Malbecs from California. Um, although um, Malbec is actually only less than a percent of the total grapes or red grapes planted in California, um, it has got a little bit of a, a burgeoning trend at the moment. And of course, Malbec is a very popular grape variety elsewhere, um, but it is fairly rare um, to come across plantings in California still. Um, and what the big differences seem to be is that Argenti Argentinian's Malbec is um, usually on its own rootstocks and it's from very old vines. Whereas California has, has deliberately selected um, the Malbec clones that it thinks will work very well from Argentina um, and then put it on rootstocks that it also um, thinks will help um, in terms of what they're hoping to get from the final wine. Um, so in this case, it's mainly around trying to make sure that it can cope with quite arid, dry conditions and that it also doesn't, um, doesn't sort of um, focus entirely on the fruit and on the yields. So they are looking for a quality um, to come out of the production here. Um, and I think I was more impressed than I wanted to be um, after this tasting and really enjoyed quite a few of the Malbecs I tasted. And I also really embrace American wines that show good value. And for me, that happens to be under £10. Um, there are very few American wines that I can, I can successfully list under £10. And this is one of them. And I think actually... It offers a huge amount of pleasure for that price point. It's got a lot of um, dark fruit character. It's clearly showing its Malbecness with its kind of plum and bramble um, character there, but it also has a little bit of oak, um, which is coming through. So there's a bit of vanilla. And here it's been very cleverly made by a, a great winemaker called Beth. And Beth works um, for part of the Gallo family. So this is part of the Gallo brands. 
which can be also quite um, unusual for the Wine Society to work with such a large winery. Uh, but Gallo, I think, have some of the, the most um, incredible access to some of the world's or some of California's best grapes. And they have some very talented people. And Beth uh, Liston here is, is an extremely talented winemaker who is managing to make um, this wine, I think, just incredibly enjoyable and very easy drinking um, straight away. And some of the way in which does that is that it's picked at night. So they pick all the Malbec at night to really try and um, pick it while it's cold so it doesn't get that slightly soupy fruit note or that slightly cooked vegetable note that you can sometimes get on, on Malbec. Um, but it also gets into the winery in a good condition so that then they can really um, sort of keep the fruit and keep the freshness. But yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, Sarah, I'm, I'm really enjoying it, uh, actually. It's a real fruit bomb in a, in a lovely way. You know, it's a really generous, just... In a similar sort of way to the Zweigel, it's just a really sort of friendly, here I am, you know, I'm willing to please uh, type of type of wine. Um, so I'm enjoying it. And I think it's, it's nice, as you mentioned, you know, there's all that kind of brambly and dark fruit. But I think the oak is also giving a nice extra layer of complexity. I get an almost kind of like mocha coffee sort of note yeah. on, on the palate, um, which is quite pleasant as well. Um, yeah. It's sort of screaming out for a nice bit of steak or something a nice sort of charred think, steak or something like that without being too stereotypical it seems to be screaming out for me for a burger mm -hmm. <laughs> it's got that sort of it's soft enough it's not got enormous sort of comp it's not got tricky tannins it could no. go quite happily with a, oh. a sort of soft juicy burger with some caramelized onions and something else so we've, it's that we've, sort got of to, we've got to stop doing these just before <laughs> dinner time because yeah. i'm so hungry now <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go and get a burger. Yeah, but um, Sarah, with with the, with the oak on this uh, American oak, I'm I'm guessing. Well, they're they're using so this isn't um this isn't the beautiful sort of picturesque winemaking. So this is staves. So they've yep. got stave lined um, steel tanks, which is a yep. fairly classic way of making um, good value wine from America to have smoke influence. And it's been shown to be very controllable too. So because you're you're really in charge of those staves and you can get quite high quality oak now in a stave format yeah. um, that can go in the inside of a in a tank um it will be american oak but also some french so i think they're they're using a component of both um it's also not i was asking for some detail on it and i, I believe that it's not in every tank so it's only a very small proportion actually that receives any oak at all and then it's blended so it's yeah. um it, the balance is what they're looking for yeah it certainly doesn't overpower it at all it's a really nice kind of compatriot to the to the juicy fruit isn't it and it is it's very american but in a be in the best way possible and it, it does make me think because a lot of the argentinian malbecs i found i find them that because they're mainly using french oak they use so much of it to make an impact on the wine. And I find them yeah. go, go very tannic and they dry out quite a lot. So I'd, I'd love to see more American oak being used in, in Argentina just to give that really drinkable Malbec style. I mean, I, I yeah. really like this. I remember tasting it with you in the tasting room. And I think we both kind of yeah. looked at it and being like, why do we like this so much? Because <laughs> it's just genuinely... Well, I think there is a time and a place for lots of different styles of wine. And I think we can get quite in our heads about... Um, finding very sort of almost like the, the Zweigelt with that green sappy nature and the slightly more complex savory spice going on, higher acidity, all of those things. Um, and we really can get quite geeky about it and really enjoy it. Um, but I do adore my American hat and buying the American wines for, for the Wine Society. And I love how approachable some of them can be. Although of course there are some savory wines from America now, but them they're so gentle and, and a bit of a hug and i i think this is a bit of a hug so oh, i yeah. hope that a few people um really enjoy it and, and have a burger tonight which now i might have to order on delivery yeah, i mean i'm, I'm <laughs> we've had a uh, a couple of questions sarah about uh, about this wine and one that i'm going to um pop back to as well freddie just before we go into your last wine so keep that um in mind the first question is from from Andrew about the um about the staves actually um and Andrew I don't think it's a ridiculous question at all but it's it's he's asking when they're actually in the barrels are they um are they curved to the barrel to the the barrel or are they straight but I suppose being in a stainless steel tank they perhaps 
are less bowed than you ex expect from it's, a typical... It's not parent. at all a, a silly question. There are some amazing forms of technology using staves in, in different formats now. Um, in this case, um, and more commonly, they are they are the length of the tank. So they go in um, upright and they will run top to bottom rather than round. So they don't have to be bent or curved. Um, and they usually are strapped together um, and form almost like a netting around the edge of the, the tank. And it means that they can be um, very clearly um, controlled. So you don't have to have every stave. You could have an every other going around a tank where you could have um, you know, every third so you can reduce the amount of oak to the wine, um, but it's also um, keeping it on the edge. The, the difference really um, in a technical sense is that you're not going to get the same level of oxidation that you would get in barrels. And of course it's in a much larger unit. So it would be comparable to some of the large food rows, but you're not getting that um, ingress and, and exit of, of oxygen. That you might through old wood, although it's at a very um, micro level. Um, and there are equipment pieces, micro oxygenation um, devices that work, and you would put something in your tank and it would actually bubble very small, fine streams of oxygen through your wine if you wanted to, to control that element as well. Um, but no, it's uh it's something that I on my very first trip to California, um Pierre actually told me I had to get in touch with somebody and <laughs> who worked in the oak industry in California. And he said, this guy will know where the, the bodies are buried. And I met up with him for dinner and I had a fantastic dinner with him. He's a, a real character. Um, and he sells some incredibly expensive, very fine French um, oak barrels and really was able to tell me who was buying what and where. Um, but the level of, um, of change and of um, trying to make oak slightly more accessible um, to a wine that is not at a you know, $100 plus price point um, has been hugely successful over the last few years. So it, it's come a long way. That's great. And that sort of touches on a comment that we've had from David Peacock about the um, the use of sort of staves and other um, forms of, of getting oak into a wine, so perhaps whether using chips, um, um, whether it, it historically has perhaps put people off because they're thinking it's perhaps, you know, um, it's not as good an option, but actually hearing you talk about it now and the actual the thought and the technology and that that goes into it it's a well thought out practice and it gets the oak influence to the level that the winery wants it to one so the, the snobbery there is a bit yeah no and one of the great advantages of staves in particular i think more so than than chips um for me is that staves can be thoroughly cleaned and reused so of course it doesn't always have to be new oak you can be using second and third and fourth year oak as you would do with barrels um, having you know used it in a tank the previous year, but you can thoroughly get it out and properly clean it, um, which is always difficult with oak barrels when they're intact. You know, lots of wineries spend a lot of time steam cleaning and and trying to get those barrels um, ready for the next um, fill. Um, but there is always a little bit of a biological risk, um, or there can be a bit of a risk um, with each barrel. And so each barrel then has to be tasted in a very clear way and and monitored for, for any issues. Um, and I don't think that is necessarily as, as tricky with, with staves, which can be removed and thoroughly cleaned. Um, so no, there are, some, there are going to be some positives and some negatives. And, but I, I have to say that um, going in as skeptic, maybe 10, 15 years ago about oak alternatives, um, I've definitely seen some huge improvements and I would challenge on a lot of wines to, to really be able to blind taste um, the type of oak used when done well with oak alternatives. But of course it is when done well. So there are there are plenty of examples of, of poor oak alternatives being used, but also poor barrels being used. Thanks, Sarah. So Freddie, just before we go on to the um, final wine, I'd like to just go quickly back to the Zweigelt um, because it did come up again when we're talking about the Malbec and the kind of the comparison to the Zweigelt and how the Zweigelt has that sappy character. So we've had a um, question from Jane and again, it's a little bit on descriptors. Um, and she's saying, that obviously it's a term that she's seen a lot. She doesn't know if sort of a full definition, but has an idea of what she thinks it means. Um, she hasn't said what she thinks it means, but I would personally for me, I always find it's like a perception of tackiness almost, a tacky grip rather than furry grip for myself. But is there any sort of ah, way that you would so um 
describe it <laughs> yeah so i don't think of it as to do with grip at all personally I, for me it's more what's on the nose so i think more of like pine cones pine sap that kind of a, a woody herbaceousness in a way so i i think that but on the palate but more of a sort of um a stringency a little bit from a sort of an antiseptic kind yeah. of quality. Um, so <laughs> Jane, if us, that helps going, you. <laughs> going back to us saying about how we write things in notes that actually don't sound very attractive. It's got a sort of an antiseptic sort of quality. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, so for me, I think sappy is definitely something that I personally, and again, it is different for everybody, of course, but I personally equate to what I find on the nose. And yeah, it's that kind of fresh pine sap, pine cone kind of sort of green but not green herbs kind of thing um and i think it certainly uh, suggests a particular kind of vigor in the wine you know a kind of an energy uh, a lift uh, I, I suppose don't know if that helps who knows matthew sarah anything you want to i i i too i i do think that it's a it's a an aroma or a flavor but i i do find i i i feel it's a a, a palate thing as well it's almost like um if sometimes you you if you're eating a bunch of grapes for example and then you chew on the stalk it sometimes it almost kind of coats your mouth a little bit it's almost slightly drying almost herby slightly um like stalky kind of character kind of dries your mouth out slightly i find that so what i call when i'm when i'm talking about sappiness because like Beaujolais, you get it a lot and we've mentioned menthir already sometimes that can have that slightly sappy um character um i don't know whether sarah thinks that or it's total nonsense but that's that's how i get it no i think i'm, I'm with all, all three of you i think there is a, <laughs> Ever the there is a textural part but there is also a, a definite flavor profile i think that's like the antiseptic sappy green pine um, note that we're trying to describe is is unique to each of us in our specific descriptor but um, somebody's put in the chat, I think, dried herby character. And I think that probably sums it up as well as anything else. But it's that kind of... Do you think it it is, um, for me, I think it's almost that's the, or, not what I mean. It's so weird. You think it's sort of slightly fresh, like a yeah. wetter. Yes. Um, I'm thinking of like, yeah, it's not sweet, of course. But I'm thinking if you if you tap into a pine tree and you get literally the sap that comes out, that's kind mm -hmm. of a sort of an aromatic lifted but it's not dried it's not i'm not thinking of like dried thyme Oregano, or Oregano type no. of thing no anyway so, yeah <laughs> i would go back to my rose stems yeah I mean, uh, rose stems quite, is a great one yeah it's quite um a green sort of green note yeah resin uh, is the one yeah somebody's just put that in the, in the chat um catherine how are we doing for time because i've still got the bulgarian wine we are minutes left we have a few minutes left, so we can go straight on to the uh, the last wine. I think, we, members, you've been very helpful getting your questions in at the time of the wine, so thank you. Um, so, Freddie, yeah, if you'd like to take it away with the last one. Excellent. I'm uh, Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to revisiting this wine. Um, so, Bulgaria, I think, is at the moment quite exciting. It's certainly on a uh, sort of, um, I don't want to say up and coming, um, but it's every single time I go to Bulgaria taste the quality is getting better and better. Uh, there's a lot of winemakers who have been able to kind of travel and learn about winemaking in different countries and they're bringing that skill back home and they're also investing in their equipment and so on. Um, so there's some really, really exciting stuff happening in Bulgaria. Bulgaria, if we could just quickly actually go on to the, uh, the map, um, just to give people an idea. So Bulgaria is uh, surrounded by, by countries. So we've got Turkey, Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, and Romania all um, bordering Bulgaria. And as a country, it takes uh, sort of cultural influences from, from all of those places. It's a really, really interesting country. And I was lucky enough to visit there in oh, 2018, I think it was. Um, and it was a fantastic visit. I had no idea really what to expect, to be honest. It was my first time going there. Um, I uh, went on a bit of a whim. I met a Bulgarian guy while I was judging for decanter and he said, well, come out. I'd love to show you some stuff in Bulgaria. And I went, OK, stranger, of course, you, you know, <laughs> you take me around and uh, uh, and I'll hopefully make some interesting discoveries. And boy, did I. Uh, it was it's beautiful. Um, so the wine that we've got here is made from Mavrud. Uh, which is an indigenous Bulgarian grape variety. Um, interestingly, and I think it's actually a bit of a shame, the majority of production of Bulgarian wine is actually uh, made up of international grape varieties. So things like Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot really do dominate. 
Um, but there's a bit of a resurgence uh, of these indigenous grape varieties. And it's really for a long, long time, or historically really been controlled by the demand from places like Russia, um, where they want to be able to drink Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and so on. But it's much cheaper for them to source that from somewhere like Bulgaria, with it being so much closer than, than say, France. Um, but yes, there's a real resurgence of these indigenous grape varieties. Um, the, we've got a couple of pictures, I think. Um, so first of all, on the, just going back to the map quickly, uh, if we could. Um, so we're with this wine, we're in the Thracian lowlands down in the south there. So we're really not that far from, from the sort of the Turkish border, um, really. Um, Mavrud is planted in most of, of Bulgaria, but this is a kind of a key area for the grape. Um, if we just click on to the next picture, and I'm going to pour myself a glass. So this gives you a bit of an idea about the, uh, the, the landscape of the region. So one thing that blew me away with Bulgaria is this uh, wonderful uh, contrast of flatlands and then dramatic mountains that they have. And it actually reminds me a little bit, albeit on a smaller scale of, of America. And I've only been to, um, I've only been to Washington State uh, in America, but I remember driving down these very long straight roads and everything's flat, but in the distance you've got mountains. And it's, it's quite a lot like that there. So in the Thracian lowlands, um, a lot of the vineyards really are planted down on the flats and um, climate wise this is a this is an area which in the summer can get very very hot and in the winter can get very very cold so we're talking you know quite easily up to sort of you know 30 degrees uh, and above in the summer um, and then down to sort of minus 15 quite often in the winter so it's quite extreme in that sense and very continental but grapes like Mavrud do quite well this is quite a late ripening grape variety um and it makes oh yeah i mean you've got the snow-capped mountains uh, in the backgrounds of the vineyards it's a very dramatic place i do think they need to replace their um their their posts their uh, their trellising posts uh, perhaps they're looking a little bit uh, haggard but otherwise beautiful um so yeah, Maverick, it, late ripening makes these really full-bodied styles of red wine. Um, but what I like about this winery, so this is uh, <laughs> confusingly, and I touched on this earlier when I was going through the uh, Moldovan wine about how in, in not to generalize, but this part of the world, um, uh, often wineries will have God knows how many different labels and it gets very confusing. And, and this is a great example of that. So the winery is Carabunar Estate. And I don't know which then comes next, whether it's Via Venera is next and then Bulgarian Heritage comes under that, or whether it's Bulgarian heritage and within the Bulgarian heritage range, it's the Via Venera range, who knows? All I know is that the Bulgarian heritage wines that I tasted when I visited, I was really, really impressed with. And we've had a couple of others come and go. We've done a misket uh, from them, which is confusingly, uh, it, it tastes and sounds like Muscat, but has nothing to do with Muscat, but is delicious. And we've also done uh, an orange wine from them as well, from the Dimyat grape, uh, which is another indigenous Bulgarian grape variety. But what this winery seemed to do really, really well, and why I decided to buy this wine, was they are able to make their wines, and this sounds like a bit of a, a no-brainer, but make their wines in a very accomplished way. There's a lot of wine still being made in Bulgaria, which is very OTT. You know, the more tannin and acidity, the better, uh, as far as a lot of the wineries are concerned, um, which is a very old-fashioned view. You know, it's literally the approach of more is more, right? Uh, but actually, I think uh, we're lucky in the UK that you know we're a country with a, with a, a fairly refined palate, and uh, more isn't always more uh, for us. Balance is more, you know, that's what's more important. And they make uh, wines which have balance. And I think this is an example. It's a full-bodied wine. It's got dark fruit flavors. There's a bit of a kind of a leathery, sort of alluring kind of uh, note to it but it's balanced, you know, it doesn't blow your head off like some of the other examples can do. So I was really impressed with it. Um, and it's gone down really well since, since we've listed it, which is nice. And I think is a, a, a wines like this are a testament, I think, to, to society members. You know, we're lucky as buyers at the Wine Society to be able to, to put wines in front of such a fantastically engaged crowd, engaged crowd, if I can speak properly, that'll help, um, who are willing to try new things. Uh, and I'm sure most people hadn't perhaps had a Mavrud before, but I'm really pleased to say it's been selling really, really well, which is great, um, you know, and it's got some nice reviews and uh, I'm really pleased with it. So I hope everyone else is too. <laughs> Matthew and Sarah, have you had Mavrud before or is this your first? <laughs> I think I've only ever had this one, but uh, it's great. I mean, it is, it's what it says on the tin. It's, it's a big, full-bodied, quite tannic, juicy, dark fruited red um yeah so i, th I think mavro is 
Greek for black, and so it gives an idea of kind of the style of of the wine. It's 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 a really generous wine. Um, mm. Yeah, I think it's I think it's great. You know, I think some people might think it, it needs it needs food. It could go with some red meat and some fatty pork or lamb or whatever. But um, I think it's it's very impressive. It's pretty. It's I think pretty it's good. one of those wines. Um, I think somebody's saying it's opening up for them, but the bigger the glass and the longer in a decanter too. Because mm. I think we sometimes get quite precious about decanting wines that are only expensive. But actually, I often think that expensive wine should taste good straight from the bottle. But um, yeah. but inexpensive wines, I think, can usually always really benefit from a bit of a decant and i think that's true of most of the wines we tried tonight even if it's it's not in a very posh decanter and just thrown into a jug and put back into the bottle um a bit of air on this is, is really helping yeah um but it's got great great style i like the savory tannic sort of nature of it it seems to be very well balanced in a in a very bold powerful way yeah it's a full-bodied wine you know and it's a fairly as great varieties go it's a full throttle grape variety um but I think it's quite nice. And again, you know, a testament to what Bulgaria can offer at the moment that at this sort of price point, you can get actually quite serious, um, you know, savoury, uh, significant wines. Um, so I think Bulgaria is definitely a, a country to watch. And um, as much as possible, I'm going to keep trying to, to get behind the indigenous grapes and um, keep pushing those forwards. Because I think, you know, when they're done well in examples like this, you get a lovely balance between something which is very unique uh, and has its own personality, but also actually um, it, it's, it's very interesting and genuinely going back to it, very drinkable. <laughs> I had one question come in um, on this, and I think we've touched slightly about it um, in terms of food pairings. Um, Matthew giving some suggestions. I don't know, Freddie, you've got any sort of Bulgarian suggestions up your sleeve that you think would would go with this. I would say for me as well, I did find that the um, I was surprised at how well integrated the alcohol is with um, with this wine being at the fourteen and a half percent. But the other question we've got from Beth is where. What other wines in Bulgaria would you recommend? Or if we got anything coming in, you said you're quite excited about where it is yeah. as, a, as a country. Anything you would suggest? So quickly, should I quickly touch on the food bit first? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think, again, it's quite versatile. I think grilled meat, grilled lamb is, is perfect with a wine like this, where you've got a bit of a barbecue char kind of thing. Um, I was just trying to cast my mind back to what I was eating when I was out there, but it was a long time ago. But also things like um, uh, stuffed vine leaves actually work quite well with this because they're quite, uh, although it's, you know, uh, well, I think it's the iron in something like that, which actually pairs quite well with um, with a wine like this. Um, so those would be two suggestions. But I think also what's always a really good rule is what grows together goes together. So if you pick up a bottle like this, mm-hmm. even if you go on BBC Good Food or something, you'll probably find some really good you know, classic Bulgarian recipes, which no doubt will will pair really nicely. So it's quite a nice opportunity to, to broaden food horizons too. Um, and then uh, other Bulgarian wines, which I think are very exciting. There's quite a few actually. Um, so there's another uh, couple of great indigenous red grape varieties. Um, one of which is uh, called Broadleaf Melnik. Uh, which isn't the catchiest of names. Um, But again, similar to this, I suppose, it's quite a full-bodied, punchy red grape variety. Um, uh, uh, There's a lot of examples of it which, you know, put hairs on your chest. Uh, But actually, there's plenty of wineries that are now uh, sort of, you know, pulling the style back in a little bit and trying to uh, look at producing examples which are a little bit more bit more balanced, frankly. And there's some really good ones. So so producers like um, Villa Melnik are very good. Um, there's uh, a new wine which we have got on the way, which is called Rubin, uh, which is a all but extinct Bulgarian grape, which is much uh, sort of much lighter to medium bodied uh, in style. So again, another red grape, really quite rare. Um, but again, that's coming from Villa Melnik, uh, and that's one to look out for. But otherwise, the couple that we ch- tend to have in the range come and go a little bit depending on stock. Oh, Gamza as well. Gamza is really good. I think we have stock of that. That's that's really lovely, light, bright, crunchy red fruit, um, kind of uh, sort of Pinot-esque in a way, very delicate tannins. So um, if, if, if there's one that you go and pick up right now, uh, it's Gamza, G-A-M-Z-A. Absolutely delicious. There you go. 
Excellent. That's a bit of a Bulgarian wine shopping list for people to look for. And Peter Cousins also just re-mentioned the Bulgarian orange wine that we sell. Yes. It's very distinctive and very good. I would second that, Peter. If you haven't tried it, go ahead and put one in your basket next time you're having a browse. So that was a wonderful whistle stop tour of some of our more, I wouldn't say out there, but perhaps um, more hidden away wines that members might not have been aware of. I hope you've enjoyed it, members. If you have been tasting along with us, I hope you've enjoyed the wines. Thank you very much, Matthew, Sarah and Freddie for joining us this evening. The mix case is still available. So if you haven't had any of the wines and this has now prompted you to um, want to have a bit of exploration, you can absolutely still get that. I will pop an email around tomorrow with um, a link to the recording and to the case. So perhaps you might make a bit of a tasting um, at home. Perhaps you can get some friends around and, you know, watch again and pause and see what everyone thinks. But thanks again so much for joining us. Thank you, Anna, with the slides and everything behind the scenes. Um, thanks, buyers, and good evening. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.